Welcome. Today, I'm going to walk through a common use case I see within NIFJ, uh, which is around synthetic identity fraud, can also be called first party fraud, uh, and is basically this idea of using and faking information when opening a bank account, applying for an application, maybe that's card or a mortgage, you know, this idea of, of basically forging uh, an identity. So then I'm going to walk through a new public asset I've created uh, on the Neo4j website. And this whole website is focused around uh, industry use cases. So the website is industry use cases. Uh, and if you basically come to the web page, currently I've focused on two industries, financial services and insurance. So if you come in and you click on financial services, there are a starting a collection of use cases and today I'm going to focus on synthetic identity fraud, which sits under the, the retail banking uh, side, because that's where we predominantly see this use case. Now, the structure of this is that you know, I want to understand and portray the use case. OK, what is identity fraud? How does it work? The, the crucial part to this is understanding, OK, well, we know what identity fraud is. It's this idea of sharing and reusing information in order to basically forge an identity on a system so whether you're pretending to be michael down and you're not actually michael down when you're applying for a, for a mortgage or, or opening a bank account they are seen as fraudulent right and these are accounts and applications that you will want to catch up front now this this use case is quite a tricky one when you're using a non-graph database solution because of the way that the relationships between those pieces of information during the application aren't necessarily joined up in a world that makes it easy for you to query, show me every application that uses this piece of information, okay? And what you may also find is not just a single piece of information, they may use an email address first and then they go on to use sharing a phone number and et cetera. So although these identities you know, may not share the same information, they will probably be linked. And so what I do is talk around here during the solution is, well, why is this use case, You know, why is Graph a strong use case to, to deliver this? I've also documented here a very quick kind of very simplistic data model. So the idea here is that we have a customer, Michael, who has an email address, michael at abc.com, who also has a passport number, 12345789. We also then have his other customer, Alice, who has the, the same passport number as Michael, but also has a phone number, which is shared by Adam. And now Adam shares the same email address as Michael. So this here you can see is that multiple customer records are sharing pieces of information. So it's a really simple data model. Now, in order to get started, it's really simple, right? You basically have to understand what is a customer and who is that customer. So you may have a customer ID, right, instead of a name, as I kind of demonstrated in this one. And then you will have personal pieces of information, an email address, a phone number, uh, an address, you know, a passport number, all these pieces of information that potentially could be reused across your organization. And so here it's as simple as whatever that thing is, that piece of information that you want to see if people are sharing or reusing, you would create that as its own separate node with obviously properties to identify that. So a phone number will have a number, a passport will have a passport number, and as we talked about earlier, an email has an email address. Okay, and there's just certain characteristics. They're not obviously all of them. You can choose as many as you want. Now, the crucial part of this demo is being able to walk through this uh, with some, some example data. So what I've done is I've gone to our sandbox.neoforj.com. I've fired up a blank sandbox. I've hit open, and I have created a demo, basically Neoforj database, which we can simply copy and paste these commands in to see how it works. So first, if we look at this, I'm going to create those records, all that data to basically build that representation of uh, that graph that we looked at earlier here will now be shown uh, inside of here. So you can see that we've now got customer nodes, email nodes, passports, phone numbers. Um, and if we were to bring all this data back, then we would see all of those nodes being returned in there. So you can see here, not quite as I kind of visualized it, but you get the idea that we've got these three people and these pieces of information, right? So it's exactly as it kind of seen there. Now, if we were to run the schema, Okay, so this is what it looks like visually when you actually query the data. But you'll notice that the Neo4j schema is different from that. Okay, 
And so why is that the case? Well, the reason is that when you show the scheme, and you'll notice that some of these uh, values aren't here. So if you do a style reset, what you should see, let me my face out of the way, you should see that now they've reset. So sometimes it's just around the styling perspective. And now we can see that, well, although the data looks like this, the schema is actually a slightly different representation. And that's because obviously we have a customer node, a customer node has a phone number, a customer has a passport, and a customer has an email, right? And that's the kind of the schema level. But what actually happens obviously is we have multiple customers, okay? And those multiple customers have different pieces of information. And that's how then we're able to get this ring effect. Whereas obviously when you look at the schema, you're thinking, well, wait a second, there's no rings in here. Well, there actually is. If you think a customer has a phone number and then a customer has an email and you've got another customer up here who has a phone and an email, you've got a ring. It's just that this is showing it without any of the properties, without any of the uniqueness. It's just showing it uh, as the scheme. So we've got exactly what we saw, thought, exactly as documented here. And so what we can do now is we can go ahead and we can say, right, right, let's run some cipher queries. So first, I want to identify customers that share, share the same email address. So here we've got the cipher query. So I've just literally clicked on here to copy, come across here to paste. And what you'll see is we're going to look for customers following the has email relationship, which we can see this one here, to an email node, which is there. And then we're going to follow that back, obviously someone else who also sharing that same email and then has the email. And you'll notice this is C2 and this is C1. And this is basically saying we don't want to share the same customer. We want these customers to be unique. And so when we run this query, you'll see we have Michael and Adam who both share the same email address michael at abc.com so you can see how simple this is from a process of just what a simple query but the complexity this would kind of include if you were to do this in a relational database it would not be as simple as that and we're getting to even more complex from later now what you'll notice is there's different ways of writing this so in in the earlier example i had put in here has email right whereas now we can leave these as blank and if i run this you'll get the same response. Because, why are you getting the same response? Because in order to get from a customer to an email, as you'll see if we go back to our schema down here, customer to email, there is only one route they can take as email. So from a performance perspective, it's much better to declare exactly which relationships you want to traverse down. And in here, I could have explicitly told it that I wanted to look at the email node, again, I'm being very selective and therefore optimizing this query. Again, it's just returning back exactly the same response in order to basically make this query run as quickly as possible. So that's how we find an email. Okay. We can also then identify customers that share multiple characteristics, multiples of these aspects. And so if I go up here now and I say, right, I want a customer who either traverses down the has email or has phone or has passport. And it will get me to a node, one of these three. And I want to basically go down any of the routes in order to basically get to the other side. Now, this is going to return back the full ring, OK? Because we're saying, well, you can traverse in any way you want in order to match these up. And so now we are basically able to traverse around the whole kind of circle, the whole set of, of properties in order to get to the other side. So now you're seeing these kind of broad rings. Rings of people who are sharing these information. And literally, the great thing about a graph is that is literally a ring. We can then go on and we can say, well, is there any graph data science, GDS aspects to this that we can work with? And one of the really uh, interesting parts of this is that the sandbox has all of the GDS aspects just built in. So you can go and you can play right on, on smaller data sets to get going like this, but it's all there ready to go. So one example is the weekly connected components algorithm. And if you want to go and read some more, just click on the link and it'll take you to our GDS documentation where we talk about the weekly connected components and we talk about how to run it, et cetera. Now, what I've done here is I've taken that and I've, again, for this use case, I'm going to provide you a very simple, very quick walkthrough in order to get there. Now, the first thing about the weekly connected components algorithm is it needs what is called a monopartite graph. It basically means it needs nodes pointing to other nodes. And you could say, well, OK, well, that's, that's happening. If I look at these notes here, they are pointing. But we want to say that Adam is sharing information with Michael. Michael is sharing information with Alice. Alice is sharing information with Adam. 
So basically jumping across here, which is why on the left-hand side now, you'll see that there's now this new linked relationship. So if I come up here and I click on linked, you'll now see that we've now got these kind of direct connections between a monopartite, a single node type, and therefore this linkage. And so now what we can do is we can project the graph. Okay, and so projections are basically taking this, oh, I've already created it on here, taking this uh, data set and being able to bring that into memory in order for us to run a graph algorithm on top of it. So what we can do is we now have projected this under a graph name of my graph one. And what we can do is we can say, right, what we want to do using the my graph one projection is I want to run weekly connected components, WCC. I want to stream those results from my projection back to the screen. So when I run this, you'll see that they all sit inside of the same community. Now, one last thing we can do is we can then write those results back to the graph. So we can say, right, WCC, now instead of stream, we're going to use write. I'm going to give it my projection, my graph one. I'm going to tell it which property to write it back to. So we'll now have a new property called component ID. And when we do this, you'll notice that three nodes have been written with one, com uh, you know, one basically there's only one group. So if I now come in here and I look at our customer nodes, which are now again related, you'll notice there is now this new property, right? And this now is the ID of the group of the community they're all uh, inside of. Now, obviously, if there's another community next to it that where they weren't connected, this would be group community zero, and then the next one would be community one. And so that very quickly shows you how you can start with a very simple data model up here with some simple data to insert and go all the way through from writing quite simple queries to slightly more complex to running GDS algorithms and showing you how that all works inside of Neo4j. I hope that was helpful uh, and I look forward to you reaching out if you've got any questions around anything that I've touched on today.